Uh, we're doing a joint kind of panel today. My name is Patty Kramlinger. I am the philanthropic advisor for the Mankato Area Foundation. And I'll be co-hosting along with Tim today. And Nancy, Tim, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Tim Beaton, the executive director of the Fargo-Moorhead Area Foundation. And I am uh, Patty's colleague, um, and I am the president and CEO. I'm, I'm, I'm president and CEO. You got up your game <laughs> of the Mankato Area Foundation. So um, I'm, we're, we're going to let Tim kick this off, but we would like this to be like really conversational. So please, you know, Emily, I know you're shy, but just raise your hand every once in a while and ask a question. Same goes for you. So um, go ahead, Tim. You're very fortunate because we were just talking about having everybody stand up in a circle and count off and we were going to yell numbers out and you were going to have to give your, your version of what it is that we're supposed to talk about today. Um, for a few minutes until a few minutes ago, I thought I was going to have to do this thing solo. And as I explained to somebody upstairs, I've always been schizophrenic, but I didn't know if I could do a three part. Yeah. So, uh, but it works out here. Um, Back in the late 30s and the early, and all during the 1940s and up until 1951, there was a very famous bank robber who uh, plagued the entire country. Willie Sutton was his name, Slick Willie Sutton. Um, when he was captured, he was interviewed by the uh, Saturday Evening Post and was asked the question, why do you rob banks? And his answer was rather terse and to the point. He said, because that's where the money is. And to some degree, folks, that's why we're here. It's, it's a little bit of a twist on it, but uh, the question is, why do we uh, solicit and, and try to work with advisors? Because that's where the money is, or at least they are the guards of the money. They're the ones, they may not get the money to us, but they certainly can prevent the money from coming to us. They, they, they will stop us on that. Um, who are these people? Well, uh, they're, they are the usual suspects, as I say, uh, on here. And kind of what role do they play, at least from our standpoint at the Fargo-Moorhead Area Foundation? Uh, we look at them as being the lawyers and attorneys is the first group on that. Uh, they are the end of the line in terms of estate planning. They're the, 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 uh, the, the last uh, kind of a gasp, if you will, bad choice of words. Uh, but they're working with working with the client as they prepare their uh, end of life gifts, uh, the the transfer of wealth through their will and estate plan. And it's an opportunity, probably not to gain initial dollars. Maybe it is, but for the most part, we've seen that these are the people who will provide us with bequests. And bequests we've learned anyway are generally much larger than the gifts during the course of life. You you, you wind up with a bigger dollar amount. Uh, it's kind of uh, uh, you know they aren't going to need it anymore anyway. They're not saving it. You might as well give it on to charity. The Tim, second, Tim, did we decide that this was interactive so that I, we could interrupt each other too? No. So, <laughs> just to, so bequest, yes, but also we recently have had um, probably two or three scenarios where attorneys have brought us, they have had a, a client who is selling a business. Ah, or good they, point. Or they've got some kind of transactional situation that's happening that has created probably a tax consequence. And so they have brought them to us for that point. So as we have the transition of wealth, that's the other place we're seeing. Great good fortune in Mankato. We have not seen that as yet to have somebody drop it in, but that's a good point. That they're, they're there in the transactional aspect. The people that we really concentrate on in our uh, uh, for, uh, foundation are the CPAs and accountants. And the reason we do with that is that they are the people who generally see the client annually and, and talk to them. They're probably seeing on the tax return that somebody brings in the shoebox and they've got a receipt from, from the church or from the United Way or whatever the case may be. And they have a pretty good handle on, or they should have, of, of all of the advisors, what sort of uh, charitable in inclination this particular person or, or family may have. So we, we, we think that they're pretty crucial uh, because uh, they're the ones, when you really get at least, again, speaking from our standpoint, they're the ones that are going to draw the last blood in terms of taking a look at, they're going to make the decision on an annual basis whether or not the people need to give more money away or or they, they should hang on to it, uh, whatever. We are working very hard with them and trying to uh, uh, ingratiate ourselves with them. The third group, and you may not think about it, 
uh, too much as the, the CLUs or the life insurance brokers. We've had very good luck with them. Uh, uh, they, they have come to us, and, or we've come to them and talked to them about it. They said that they have clients who may have paid up policies that they're looking to do something with. They bought it for the purpose of protecting their business when they were uh, transferring it or, or working with it to build it up. That's no longer needed, but it's paid up or it's got a lot of cash in it. That's an opportunity for making a transfer. In addition to that, there's a lot of folks who uh, evidence that they would like to do something for charity at the time of their death, and they but they don't have, may not have liquid assets, it's an opportunity for them to do a piece of, of that a beneficiary, you know, 25% of the policy or something like that in, the, in a beneficiary appointment forms. And it's real, real easy to get that done and they can put it in and, and it's nice, uh, you hate to tell them this, but they can change it at any point in time that they want. They can uh, make adjustments on that. The, the fourth group that we have uh, that we work with are we call them wealth managers or, or uh, in the past they were referred to as brokers and to us these are the toughest nuts to crack because they are very very protective of the dollars that they have pulled together that they are managing and you have to show them some means that they're going to get to keep control or make something off of this on a long haul in, in our case uh, we, we, we work with them, we have a, a, a process where we can place the dollars, if they're donated to us, that we can place them back with that particular uh, uh, individual or firm so that they get the benefit of that. They, they're taking it out of the right pocket and putting it into the left pocket and to some degree it's actually better because when their client dies, that stuff that's left in the right pocket is distributed to the kids in California. So they're, they're, uh, uh, they, they know they're gonna keep these dollars going forward. Final group that, that I'll mention is, is the trust officers, uh, folks at, at bank trust departments. These are near and dear to me because I used to be one of them. Uh, and uh, the trust departments uh, have their frequently they have a, a living trust for someone or maybe a revocable trust of some sort of a trust and there's an opportunity there for them to counsel with Maud Frickert my favorite uh, trust clients tennis shoes support hose you know guys know all her, know her all along and if you if you deal with those folks uh, they, can, they will make a bequest or change their, their trust agreement so that there is a transfer at the time of death and or they can make transfers during the course of life. We have had extremely good luck with, with the, uh, the trust folks uh, passing those dollars on to them. Um, I'm not sure, uh, we're, we're gonna go into the how do we engage them? Is that what I'm, okay, I get to do that yeah. too. <sighs> Page two, how do we engage them? Well. We start off with, we do socials, an awful lot of them. We do, in particular, we're proud of, in fact, we do two socials a year with continuing education credits. We bring folks in, uh, we'll, we'll bring in a speaker that'll talk for about an hour and they get one credit. One of the most popular ones, I'll tell you, by the way, is, is something you can get through the Minnesota Bar to show up, and that's on ethics. Very difficult if you're an attorney or a, a life insurance agent or a, a CPA to try and get that S ethics credit. If you can find somebody out of one of those organizations to come and speak, you, you got a winner. And we have had tremendous success with that, lots of good participation. Uh, feed them a stale cracker and some cheese and a, and a Coca-Cola afterwards and, and they're all happy campers working with us. Uh, yes? Uh, when you do that, right here. Yo. No, we do. We make contact because we find out we're very fortunate. Uh, uh, in Fargo-Moorhead, we have an extremely active uh, Red River, we have the Red River Valley Estate Planning Council. We have 135 members. We meet six times a year for three hours. They get credit for that. And we have a, the, the part-time administrator we have for that knows the ins and outs of both North Dakota and Minnesota. So, so people can pick up a whole bunch of credits. And, and they have been real easy to work with to, to help us figure things out. Uh, it is difficult, difficult, I will tell you, that not so difficult for the attorneys, not very difficult for CPAs. The most difficult group to work with is the Minnesota Life Underwriters uh, Agency, whatever approves their credits. It's, it, you have to get about a three or four month head start on trying to get those credits if you want to get those folks involved. Um, uh, Chris, we yeah. work with um, Minnesota State University um, with some mis mixed success, but you can use um, an institution, educational institution like that, they happen to have a department called Strategic Partnerships. 
that we run that through. So, okay. just as what, I. What do you mean by that? They're, they're delivering the content? They, they have partnered, no, they are not delivering the content. They arrange for the content and for the content. We've used their professors, we've used other individuals, but they are responsible for getting it accredited and getting the, making sure it's CEU quality. Thank you. So you're, just, you're doing the hosting? Yes. Yes, we do the hosting. Yep. Okay, don't, more questions? Yeah, no, feel free to, to shoot out here as we go along. Um, we, uh, we do one-on-one -on -one lunches with an awful lot of folks, uh, particularly the attorneys. We'll, we'll take them to lunch. Uh, holiday season is a very popular period of time to do that. Uh, we, we <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we have, uh, we gave them, a, we've given them a choice of going to lunch with us or going for cocktails and guess which one they select most of the time. And, and it, it has worked very well. It gives us an opportunity to talk to them and thank uh, them for whatever business they may have brought to us. In the past, we've also given away some very interesting gifts to them. We have a, an artist in town who uh, does glass blowing, and we've had custom-made uh, uh, Christmas ornaments that we have given out. Uh, they're very unique, and, uh, and uh, there's a full set of them that have now gone rotating too. But it's, it's something just a little bit to say thank you for, for sending business our way. We acknowledge them on our website. We have on our website, we list those individuals who have been provided us with business over the years. And we go back, we'll be 60 years old next year. And we've got a list of all the attorneys, some of them long dead, that have over the course of the year provided uh, uh, things to us or, CP, or CPAs or whoever they are as professionals. We list those on there so they get some degree of credit on that. We have a development committee and we try to include uh, on a rotating basis as many of the, those special, those, excuse me, advisors as we can, to get them an opportunity to sit in, learn what it is we're doing and why it is we're doing it. Um, we have them, we participate, as I mentioned earlier, in the local estate planning council. This year I'm serving as the, as the chair of the board for that. Excellent opportunity because uh, they're, 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 uh, all the disciplines are there represented and, and you get an opportunity to, uh, to make a pitch to them uh, on that. If you have an estate planning council in your area or a group, maybe there's a group of CLUs or CPAs who get together periodically to just talk in general, that's, that it's a good opportunity. If you can get in there and, and you pay for the coffee, it, it, uh, it, it bears fr fruit on that. Uh, finally, there's one, and both of us, we heard it at, when we were at uh, a conference in, in Kansas. Uh, we don't use it, but I think it's an excellent idea. One of the community foundations there said that they filled a jar full of candy and went to some of their selected advisors and put it on the desk. It has the logo of, logo of the community foundation on it and a card taped on the back part of it. And it says, when your jar gets empty, give us a call and we'll come and fill it up. And they said they have had repeated calls on that. And what was the story? One, one day uh, the guy was delivering candy and the attorney was there said, ah, glad to see you because I've got this check for $10,000 I meant to give you and I haven't had a chance to drop it off and deliver. So, so it bears fruit right up front on that. But it, again, ingratiates yourselves. It puts you in front of them. So and you heard us talk or somebody talk about awareness. This is what the group is, is to make them aware. You're so, on. So yeah, so I want to explain some, sort of our... Uh, Excuse me. So, our kind of history with this. Um, when I started with the Mankato Area Foundation, we were volunteer run. Um, this was we'd been around since 1974, but in 2009, we were still volunteer run, and we were two million dollars. Um, I'm proud to say now we're 20 million dollars, and we did this through this. Um, so early on, I had a board member who said, "Nancy, we got to be." He, he was an investment advisor. He said, "Nancy, we got to be reaching out to the to these trusted advisors more often." Um, let's start having, and he called them intimate events. And so we would talk about it, and we finally decided that was not a good term to use, that we're <laughs> inviting you to an intimate event. Um, but it started out just that, you know, in his office, four o'clock in the afternoon, cheese and wine. But as you all know, we get so busy going down so many other rabbit holes um, during the day that the amount of time it takes to schedule with somebody and then, nope, nope, that's not going to work. And nope, these three people can't come now. Now we want to do it on Friday that I just would give up after a while. You know, I, so I probably met with, I don't know, maybe a dozen people a year. 
Um, but I realized, because we quickly, even in those dozen people, realized what value we were getting back from these individuals. So um, early on, um, I thought, we need somebody dedicated to this. Now, Patty and I had worked together professionally because she was the development officer with Minnesota State University for a dozen years in the area of science, engineering, and technology. And we happened to have a significant fund that funds into science, engineering, and technology. So we knew each other quite well. She came to me one day and said, I'm going to retire. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I've got an idea for you. So Patty's been working with us for the last couple years. And to give you an idea of the impact, um, the first year she was with us, um, we met with 132 people, I think, in 55 var or 35 various meetings. Um, last year, I think we met with, a, with 55, um, because you can imagine that first year we were just going out and talking to anybody who would listen, and the second year we were a little bit more selective, but that's a lot of conversations, and having someone dedicated to chasing those people down and getting on a schedule and getting um, to be able to be in front of them has made all the difference in the world. This last year, we went from 15 million to 20 million, so 25% growth. I give a lot of that credit to the relationships that we acquired through those advisors. So I'm going to let Patty talk about what, how we do it, not unlike how Tim does it, but, you know, go ahead. Yep. Thanks, Nancy and Tim. It's very similar uh, to, what, to what Tim talked to you about. Uh, we engage advisors, as Tim said. Our advisors are attorneys, CPAs, wealth advisor, advisors, CLUs, bankers. First of all, with Mankato Area Foundation, they are on our board, they are on our committee. So we have 70 people involved with the board and or committees. So we use those people to help introduce us to people of their like, other accountants, other attorneys, other CLUs. Then additionally, we go to those firms, often I'll bring somebody with from our board, and meet with those firms um, and do educational events. So you think how, you know, we have to think about kind of a hook to get ourselves into them. So we tell them we'd like to have a little educational lunch with them, tell them a little bit about Mankato Area Foundation, philanthropic ideas for their clients, and the way that we work. So it's an educational event. We offer to bring lunch, we can bring it in there, or they can uh, bring it or we can have them at our facility as well. We try to go there. I think it's just better to go to them and do it in, in, in their home turf, if you will. We don't care how many people are there. We are, we'll do one or two, we'll do 10, we'll do 20, we don't care. It's just important to kind of spread the word as much as we can. We have done some wine events, but typically they seem to be lunch events more than anything else. We drink more in Fargo. We drink, they drink more in Fargo. That's it. That's it. Yes. Are you meeting with clients or are you meeting with professionals? We're meeting with professionals. Yes. And uh, from my experience and development, and as a salesperson, during that meeting with the professionals, have you seen that they kind of soften as they kind of get to know you a little bit more and what you're about? We will give them ex examples, case stories, and we'll, Nancy and I are going to talk about a little bit in a minute, and we, we prompt them to say, okay, now give us a situation that you're wondering about with your client. Obviously, don't tell us the client name, but tell us about a situation, and maybe we can help you with their philanthropic interests by engaging them through the Mankato Area Foundation. There's a misnomer amongst a lot of uh, professionals and clients out there that if their giving comes to the Mankato Area Foundation, we decide uh, where that gift will go, and that's not true, as you know. A gift through the Mankato Area Foundation can go to Fargo-Moorhead, it can go to Gustavus Adolphus College, it can go to uh, the, the pet shelter, uh, it, can, it can go anywhere. So we try to understand that we're their, get them to understand that we're kind of their philanthropic tool. And we call ourselves kind of a concierge approach. So our, let me jump back a little bit. Our educational series, we've done them for several years. Uh, we've done, um, we've talked about donor advice funds. We've talked about estate planning. We've talked about tax law changes. We recently had, uh, a, a professor from Minnesota State University in Mankato 
He's an industrial organizational psych professor, professor, and he talked about bias and the innate bias that comes with all of us in our dealings. So we try to bring different topics to them. This year, we decided to bring in CEUs. So this year, I'm meaning the calendar year, which is we're just ending in 19, hoping that would bring more people into um, our advisor series. So we partnered with Minnesota State University. We had a CLU on our, our committee to try to engage people. Um, that hasn't worked as well as it sounds like it has worked for Tim, and we're not completely sure why. We know after our surveys from our series that we did, we did one in May and one in November, and a social in the middle of them. Most of the time people are coming, at least for ours, to hear the topics and to hear the speakers, not so much for the CEUs. So we might have a little more work to do. We do use Minnesota State University. There are the, the person that submits the, uh, the topic and the, the talk you know, for accreditation. And it's like Tim has said, it's very easy for attorneys, um, CPAs, but it's harder with the uh, certified finan financial planners. It's much more hard for them to work for us to work with their agencies. Let's see where I'm going to go from here. Oh, Nancy, she changed the page on me, so here we go. I was just uh, trying to so, get it ready for you. Yes, <laughs> yes, for you. yes. Uh, we've used uh, speakers from outside of Mankato. We try to have some sort of a hook. We have Dana Holt from the Minnesota Plan Giving Council. Uh, we've been able to get her for a very reduced rate in the past and some other times not as much. So we try to look to something professional and use our advisors to give us ideas on what's going to be important to them. So we'll talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit about our advisor successes. Yep. Yeah, we've, we've done them, we've done after work, you know, at 4.30 to 5.30, and we've done usually at lunch from 11.30 to 1, and we have the same amount. <laughs> we've Are done them at golf clubs uh, for the most part. Uh, we did it at uh, Northwestern Mutual Life, hosted them in their facility. They have a, a kind of a balcony that overlooks Mankato. We had the most people there, but that was free of charge, and the, most of the people were younger in their early 30s. So for us, it's been either or. It just kind of depends on the week. You try to avoid men's day at the golf club. That can be a problem. Um, so I can't give you rhyme reason. We've, we've tried breakfast, but that hasn't worked as well. Yeah, yeah just, Tim? I was just going to say, I just returned from the National Conference of the State Planning Councils, and there was all, there's a thousand people that are talking about the estate planning councils, their different meetings. And one of the things that came through, exactly what you said, is that the breakfast meetings were the most difficult one to get people to show up for. Uh, the, uh, most of the estate planning councils actually were more socials than they were education. We were the exception to the rule. And as I said, we, we have six meetings a year with this, our estate planning council. They have a noon lunch, and then they go from there to a three-hour session where they pick up three hours of credit. If you go to all six of those, you've got 18 credits for the course of the year. You're generally done with all of your requirements. It, it, it's a cheap and easy way to do that because of, you pay 400 bucks a year for it. Going back to the individual ones, though, yeah. that we sponsor, we sponsor those in the evening it's, uh, or in that evening at uh, 4.30, yeah. 5 o'clock, yeah, yeah. that period yeah. of time. Catch them on the way home. Uh, stop by, and as I said, uh, they get one credit of CLE listening to the session, and then they get uh, a drink or two and uh, a meatball, and, and they get out of there, and they're yeah. very happy. I mean, it, it attracts them. And you're right, it seems to be the younger attorneys who are interested in making their appearance at that uh, because they recognize it's a cheap, free way yeah. for them to get a CLE credit that otherwise they might have to pay for someplace else. And if you're like us, you're like, how are we going to pay for all this? So we tend to get sponsorships. We had an attorney group that sponsored us the last time. It was a $500 sponsorship. We worked on our local golf club to give us the, a better price, and we came out just a little bit ahead of the game. We charged for the CEUs. We're wondering if maybe it's a little bit uh, too much. We're not sure. But, That's yeah. Right. I thought I heard you say something about free, and so you do charge. We, we, charge for, we charge for the CEUs. We had one free networking event. Okay. Um, but when, when we actually had the, we charged $40, which included a meal. Um, and again, we're not sure whether that's been cost prohibitive. 
Um, okay. Yeah, we're here. Yep. yep. So I think it's been interesting since I've been doing this for 10 years because when I first started making these calls, and I, one gentleman comes to mind right away because his, the first thing he said to me, he was an um, investment advisor, and he said, Nancy, I don't think this is my job to talk to them about their philanthropy. They come to me to invest their dollars. I'm supposed to make money for them. I am uncomfortable talking to them about their philanthropy. And so I, you know, of course, gave him my very best pitch about, you know, this, you, need, you need to think about this. You can't just look at one part of their lives. It's all encompassing, blah, blah, blah. About five years later, he sent me an article that LPL Financial, his organization, had sent out saying that all of you need to have a, finan or a, a philanthropic resource. If you don't have one internally in your office, you need to have one in your community. And so he oh. sent me this very cute article and then said, I'm eating my words. You are now my philanthropic resource. And that's how we pitch ourselves. When we go out and talk to them, because this is what happens. They get in front of these folks, and they either want to be philanthropic or they need to be philanthropic. And these guys are stuck then. They don't want to have the conversation about, do you want to give to puppies, or do you want to give to at-risk youth, or do you want to give to the... That, that's not a conversation they're comfortable with. So our sell to them is we will be that neutral resource for you. When you determine what they need to do financially, send them our way and we will spend the time talking with them and, fi and figuring that out and finding out what they care about because that is what they're the most uncomfortable with. And when they started to perceive us as a tool that they could use, it changed, it, it flipped a switch. And now what we're hearing, we, US Bank had us in the other day, now there are, the, the big pitch amongst these folks is it should be full service. Everybody should, everybody should be talking to their clients about everything. All the data, all the, everything shows that clients want to be asked about their philanthropy. They have a closer relationship with their advisors when they're talking about the philanthropy. They, have a, uh, they feel like their kids get more involved. So it has honestly done a 180 since I started with this. And so that's the cool thing is that we're kind of on a nice upswing as far as what advisors see as their role with their clients and then how we can participate in that. There's some national study that just was, that we get every year, and I forget what the name it's of the a, group is. It's the right? National Philanthropic Trust, yeah. where yep. clients expect their advisor to have a conversation with them about their yep. philanthropy within two meetings, folks, two meetings. Yeah. So you and, can help. And, and the big thing that, that, that we lay out them is that yep. a client's, uh, something like 80% of the clients expect that this conversation yep. will take place, and 80% yep. of the uh, um, advisors yep. say they do, but six percent of the, the clients say we re they remember the, the advisor saying anything to them. So it's kind of embarrassing. No, no, yeah, you're right. That's the, exactly the, what it says. The, the advisors say that they're talking to them, but they might just be an offhand comment or something right. because the because the client never remembers that they never were ever talked the conversation. to. Conversation. And we take the pressure off the advisor. I'll think. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was going to ask Nancy if she remembers where that article came from. Yeah, the National Philanthropic Trust. No, the one that oh, I'm talking about. talking about. It came that straight, one? I have it, I could. It came straight from LPL Financial, sent it out to their financial advisors. Okay. Talking okay. about how you need to have a philanthropic resource because that is part of the service. If you can't provide the service, you need to find somebody who can because it's part of the whole package. Is LPL a local financial service? No. Isn't it? No, LPL's national. Okay. Uh-huh. And as I was referring to, we take some of the pressure off the advisors, and they might feel that pressure and say, look, when you get to that point where your client is indicating they want to be more philanthropic, suggest that you meet with them with us. Or if they'd like, they can meet with us, or we can meet with you. So we make it easy on yourselves, as we try to tell them, and engage in a way that's comfortable for you and your clients. Well, and that, and that so. makes them more comfortable than they you know, you have to build up a level of trust with these advisors because this is a relationship that they hold near and dear to their heart. And so they're a little reluctant initially just to go, here, go, go meet with these folks, and I don't know how they're going to necessarily treat you or talk to you or whatever. So yeah. the fir very first few meetings, the advisors are almost always in the room because they want to hear what that conversation is like. After they get a level of trust with us, they just send them over to us now, and we don't have that anymore. I was going to say I was recently meeting with uh, someone from Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. um, and they sent me this um, uh, internal uh, document that says 
of high net worth households give to charity. Yes. And then the next uh, statistic is 90% of high net worth clients say they expect their advisors to discuss philanthropy within the first several meetings. And yep. that goes exactly That's contrary to the way most financial advisors slash brokers go. Yep. They have spent a lifetime building a, a pool of dollars that they manage and that's what pays for their kids college and everything else it's that's what it is and now they're talking about dismantling that and and it's, it's very it's very difficult to do that that's and we'll, get in, you know, we'll slide into that because I, we have some we have a very uh, at the Fargo Moorhead Area Foundation we have in our bylaws that anyone who comes to us and opens up a brand new fund with us has a one-time opportunity to nominate any financial manager anywhere in the world, anybody. And if, if they pass muster, and if they agree to follow our investment policy, we will take the dollars that are donated to the, us, and we will place those dollars back with that financial manager. That has not worked well with Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch because they have very high thresholds. You have to get a half a million dollars or something, otherwise the broker doesn't get paid. But I'll tell you, pass it on to keep this in mind. Edward D. Jones folks are big. They like this. Uh, to the extent that, that uh, uh, Greg Deal, our development officer, and I were on a Midwest telephone conference call for all of the, the, the brokers, the Edward D. Jones folks in North Dakota, Minnesota, and part of Wisconsin and, and Iowa, explaining what it is we're doing. And we, we've been fielding phone calls from all over the, <coughs> all over the place. Yeah. What is your dollar threshold on that? Well, this is where we get into our operations department and our development department just started banging heads against each other. Because currently we have a $25,000 minimum. And, and we, we are thinking we're going to have to raise that at least to 50. I know that other people have 150 when I'm, when I'm 200, you know. Uh, but in our case, we're trying to find a way to, to semi-automate that so that when they come in, uh, but the one thing is we don't have to track all kinds of crazy investments because here's the investment policy, follow that. If you don't follow that, we're going to take the money back. And so um, I, I set up my fund. My one-time opportunity is Susie Smith with Edward Jones. And five years later, Susie Smith is no longer in that industry. Does it come back to you then? Is that the difference? or does it go to the next person who takes over Susie that, Jones? That depends on the Edward Jones office. If they, if they transfer that, that client relationship, if we don't know about it, nothing you know, that takes place. But if we find that the broker has retired on that, we'll go back to the donor and say, you selected this donor, that donor has died or has retired or whatever else it is, we're going to consult with you again. Where, would, where do you want us to retain those dollars at so that same broker? broker specific, not yeah, no, broker, we, okay. it's the one-on-one -on -one relationship that we're trying to, to honor. So we have the same thing. Ours is called Investment Partners Program. I've been talking to Emily about it. And um, we, we don't, we're not quite as, as, I don't want to say you're rigid, but you have that in your bylaws. It's in the bylaws. Right. So that has been probably the biggest cause for our success is because exactly what Tim said, these guys have been busy building up this portfolio. And then you go meet with them and you've got, and there's a donor who just sold their business and they have a half a million dollars that they should probably make a charitable contribution to offset a tax consequence. Do you think those people want a half a million dollars to leave their portfolio? But if you offer them the opportunity that if you bring that fund to us, we will turn around and reinvest it in your, it, with the donor's choice. And so don't, ultimately the donor decides whether they want it pooled with us or whether they want their investment advisor. I would say 90% of the time they choose their investment advisor. And it advisor. stays with them in perpetuity. And that and, and the story we've told is that, again, my favorite uh, trust client was Maud Frickert. And Maud leaves uh, uh, $10 million in her living trust when she dies. And, or with her brokerage account, excuse me, brokerage account. And when Maud dies, her two grandsons who live, one in California and one in New York, split that money and it's gone. Mm -hmm. And he never yeah. see they never see that money again. Whereas if they've made a donation to the Fargo Moorhead Area Foundation, that broker continues to manage those dollars for the benefit of uh, in that particular fund. And it, I, I'm sorry if I make it cheap and sound very crass, but the fact of the matter is this is a difficult group of people I think to try and work with. Attorneys, 
uh, have hearts, believe it or not. I'm one of them, uh, <laughs> small, but whatever. CPAs are, are interested in, in, in philanthropy. CLUs are interested in philanthropy. The most difficult group we've had anyway, and maybe I, I'm more of the exception, is, is the brokers, the folks, because it, it represents their livelihood, period. I would contrast that, though. Okay. That has that we have had great success with investment advisors because of the IPP because it doesn't leave their fund, and we have found some individuals that are just very philanthropically minded and who have brought us a number of clients. So, um, it we, it just you know there's different cultures in different industries and in different communities, and I think that kind of there's a flavor yeah. that it picks up. There, um, there is yeah. If, 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 if you're right. Uh, Andy Patterson, who runs the Sioux Falls Community Foundation, reported to me at the last conference that, brace yourself, during the first quarter of this year, he received $48 million in pass-through DAF dollars that came through. $48 million and from one broker who is passing those dollars out. Oh and he, he likes Andy, and he does the work for him. The, the, they make a big donation, this, these people donate in there, and then Andy works with them <coughs> over the course of the next couple of years, making these distributions over a period of time. And if I could, I want to take your question in a second, but if I could just kind of comment on the whole, the broker, you know, thought process. They might be interested in sending, you know, their clients for a donor advice fund to the Schwab and the Fidelities, and they're out there, of course. And their fees are a little bit less than Mankato Area Foundation. But when you're investing in a Schwab and a Fidelity, wherever their office is in Chicago or Minneapolis or St. Louis, that company is not invested in the community. They're not invested in Laverne. They're not invested in Fargo-Moorhead. They're not invested in Sioux Falls. They're not invested in Mankato. Here at the Mankato Area Foundation, those people that are interested and they're from greater Mankato, they know that by going through us, it's we that are putting the parks in there, supporting backpack food programs, uh, homeless youth, you know, it goes on and on. So we try to think, uh, for those brokers to think of us as a way to connect them to the, the uh, interest and the giving that's important to them. And your question? Growth pays for some workload and yeah. capacity. That was that was our answer. I mean, we currently have 15 money managers that, that we serve. Yeah, we have 17. Working. Yeah, and we have we're, 17. We are we've just stumbled across something we've been looking for for six years. We think we've found an organization that can at a very low dollar amount. You will share that with us <laughs> for a dollar for you know, yeah. the right amount of money. Yeah. that will do the aggregation work for us on a monthly basis. The, the uh, fund managers will send in their raw data to this in, this organization, at least this is our understanding right now, and they will roll it all up and provide us with a report that compares everybody's performance and gives you the same measurement of, of everyone. They'll measure IBM stock, IBM stock, IBM stock, whatever. You'll, it'll all be measured the same way. And But uh, the original people we looked at wanted $70,000 a year to do this. No, we're looking at something below twenty. We have our investment committee <coughs> helps monitor that. Yep, go ahead. Me? You blue shirt guy? Yep. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> do you get a small fee out of that? I mean, if it goes back to the broker, do you get anything off of that? No, okay. we don't take anything back. We get our ongoing, in most cases, <clears throat> if it's going to a broker, it's an endowed fund, and we're going to take our endowed fee going forward in the future. We have our, we have our normal, um, we call the supporting fee that we're still charging. So they actually spend a little bit more when they have it at a broker like that because it's their fee and our fee. But ultimately, they have this relationship and we never, yeah. we never get pushed on that. Um, they want to keep that relationship because that person is probably still talking to them about their other investments, about their other yep. stuff. So if they could talk yep. to them about their philanthropy at yep. the same time, it all works. Yep. Um, in, in keeping with um, Tim's example, um, an advisor came to me and, and was explaining, um, he has a significant fund with us, um, with a particular donor, and he said, Nancy, when um, the next gener so when these people die, and the next generation takes over their, um, their, fin their finances, 
we will lose 80% of those. That Just will, like Tim said. Yep, they will yep. go find their buddy they went to college with, they'll yep. go do whatever, they will take it away from me. However, if I am managing their philanthropy, my opportunity to keep their other stuff stay is much higher. So he's actually targeting individuals that he wants to get keep that next generation. So he's trying to get a philanthropic fund set up with us and, and, and managed by him because he sees it as a full package of services that then he can potentially keep the next generation. So, um, so you can easily show them the benefit of, um, first of all, it's the relationship. Um, what the feedback we get from our, from our investment advisors is that when, again, when they are talking to them about multiple things, they have a deeper relationship, they have a much more um, multi-generational relationship, and then we are the value add that they're providing. That, you know, if they're just talking, you know, normally they said, okay, well, you want to give to 10 charities at the end of the year, who are they, and we'll write them down. Um, by sending them over to us and us telling them about all these great projects and programs that are going on and things they don't know about, mm -hmm. they, they see that as a value add. So that's what we refer to as our concierge approach. The, the lady who's yes, been yes, patient. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We provide them with a warning, and then they have to get back in compliance with, generally our compliance is, is performance and, and allocation, asset allocation of, you know, uh, uh, X number, X percent range, big range in terms of equities, smaller range in terms of fixed income, smaller yet in terms of various parts of the uh, equity uh, portfolio that you, know, you can put into, you know, European, et cetera, whatever. But yes, we monitor that on a quarterly basis, and if they don't mm -hmm. perform, we, we hello, what's going on? You're out of yeah. compliance. Uh, uh, what are you going to do about that? And if they don't, they know that we'll we'll come back and ask them. Now we've never had we make it so easy that same they they, they never have to worry about it. The yep. Edward Jones guys love us because they have like 30 different client types that. And, and the guy that we work with, uh, Edward Jones, our, our biggest uh, uh, fund manager, said, you're a number 23, <laughs> that's it. And it's all mutual funds. He doesn't have to do any individual picking and whatever. And, and Edward Jones continuously balances that portfolio. So it's like, it, you know, he couldn't be happier. One of the things that I also want to just have you think about, it's a little different than Tim's approach. We actually have a low um, threshold of what we will start a new fund because we have had several advisors open their own fund. Yes. Intentionally, because they want to be able to say, I opened a fund and I went onto their mm -hmm. portal and this is how I did it and I worked with them and they want to be able to speak from personal experience. Some of these guys are new, they're relatively young and we want to be working with them. So we let them open funds for 5,000, 7,500, um, just to get them started. Now, everybody that we've worked with has been adding to it over the years, that's their goal. But really, we want to get a foot in the door with some of these folks, so that borrowing is the phrase "quid pro quo." <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> we have one of our advisors who wanted to have his IR uh, to uh, he wanted to set up a, a donor advice fund with us, and he knew he couldn't manage those dollars because the conflict of interest. So he picked the Edward Jones office down the street to do that and solicited that person to open up their own donor advised fund and he is the fund manager for that. We don't <laughs> know anything excellent. about what the conversation yeah. was. Yeah. <clears throat> but just can tell you that's the way it rolls. Well, we, I don't know if you answered that lady's question. Is it more work or does she sell it to her board? Um, is it more work? Yes. Yes. Is it worth it? Ultimately, we have gained far more new funds that we now charge fees on than the workload. So it our board is... We, our yeah. board feels it has definitely been... The, the value has offset the workload. The it finance... finally come to the yeah. point where, no, it is not worth that, and we're going to have to make... Some, that's why I'm, we're looking at automating the allocation yeah. aspect of it. If we get rid of that, we're golden. But our, our finance committee and the chair sits on our board. The finance committee manages and observes investment those. Committee. I mean the investment committee. Yep. I just mixed my words up. The investment committee looks at that and manages that if that helps you, and it's not the whole board if that helps you to some extent. Yeah. I, yep. I just dig it down in the details just a little bit. So, so the broker sets up 
an account in the in the community foundation's name. Yes. So it's the community foundation's yes. account. Yes. Correct. Just transfer to it. Just they just continue to manage. To Correct. Manage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Correct. And, and the good news is that if they open up six component funds, they can pool all of those dollars at their in, in their pocket. Yeah. And they just run one fund. Yeah, I've run into. The I mean, work issue, the fee issue. I've been working. I'm frankly very frustrated working with my board to sell them on this. I mean, folks, this is why we've grown so much. Are the are these advisor accounts? If your board wants to talk to Nancy or I, we're glad to do that. Or even one of our uh, investment uh, groups as well. We have it's brought us about four million dollars. So it's actually brought us more than that. A little more than that. Okay. That was what this last year did. Just last year, yes, sorry. I a real quick question. So I'm working with my, I, I kept my broker, but I'm pissed at that person now, and I don't want anything to do with them anymore. Then does the foundation take the money out and put it in there? It's, it, it, did, 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 you're saying, can the, can the donor who originally? I'm firing my financial. He, 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 he can't fire them. It's your fund. It's the your, fund yeah. is in your name. They have to understand, name. this is not a self-directed IRA. They don't pick it. We do. And, and that's why we provide so to I the donor. You pull that out and put it in with the yeah, we show yes. the donor yeah. right up front that says, remember, you get a one-time, one-time opportunity to do that. And and if, we don't care if you have a falling out with your broker. You picked it at this time. They continue to play by the rules. They get the money. Oh, they do. Okay, so I, okay. So we, yeah, so go say ahead. that again. How did that work, too? We, we, we tell our, our donor, okay, when they come in, you open your DAF, you get it all signed, you have a one-time opportunity to nominate, <coughs> excuse me, the Edward D. Jones uh, office over here on XYZ. We go to the Edward D. Jones office and say, you've been nominated, uh, uh, let's see, due diligence, we want to see, make sure you, you haven't got some bad reports going out on you, and oh, by the way, here's, the, uh, here's our investment policy, and here's a letter that says that you will stay in compliance with that investment policy, or some, you will be subject to losing those dollars, mm -hmm. and we will take them and move them someplace else and get it out of there. Later on, if the, you come back and you say, you know, I've had a falling out with my broker, and I've moved all of my relationships someplace else, we go, that's good. I'm glad you did because but we're not because we have the relationship we so just as you said Chris it's our money that's with that broker not that individual this is not a self-directed IRA because it's becomes a gift you know in, in yeah, that way yep, so it's a gift it to up. us they've given Could them you at some point decide though well yeah you, you can Never mind. it's a gift it's yeah, yeah if they don't perform they're gone I we have about 11 minutes we can kind of <coughs> Dig into the donor advice fund. We also have some examples, some um, case stories, real quick. What's your purview, everybody? Okay, we'll give you a couple. Of, all right. <laughs> what questions do you have? I mean, that's the most that's the most valid thing. What what yes. questions do you have? One question I have is, um, you said it's worth it. Is it that it's paying for itself, or you're making money, or you have enough funds to be able to pay for your services? work with these people more to get more. Dean, when, when I came in December of 2010, the Fargo-Moorhead Area Foundation was $50 million. We're currently 83. The good portion of that, over 40% of all of our dollars that come in are DAFs. Yep. So one person can manage that. And we have, yep. Yeah. And, 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 and we have, because we have, you gotta remember, as I just said before, we have some fund managers, you're not opening up a brand new fund every time with a fund manager, whatever. Yeah. They've got one huge pool, they just add more money to that big pool. A couple of the pools are run by bank trust departments. One of them's got $17 million <laughs> of, our, of our funds there. Yeah. It's one huge pool. And so, so on our books, we, our performance measurement is that one $17 million pool is what we're looking at. Yeah, we have eight advisors right now, per, and we have 17 accounts. So, and the other thing to keep the other thing to keep in mind, if we're talking purely the mission of a community foundation, is that now these are people we are working with, and we are saying, did you know that we're building a boys and girls club in this community, and we have access to these people who have a fund now that we can help get them excited about projects in the community. So, if that was sitting with that investment advisor, you know that that would be their church, their university, their whatever. They would just do the same old same old things they've always done. But now we're exposing them to a whole bunch more things. So the other value that's a hard to, to quantify is the value to the community and the value of directing those things towards. 
um, towards uh, initiatives that you've got in your region. The um, probably the one of the easiest things that we've had to sell is that um, individuals with small family foundations. So in the 80s and 90s, yeah. you know, that it was really popular to open family foundations, and they did them for a million or two. And right now, those don't pay for themselves. Not the accounting, not the attorneys, not all the infrastructure that they need to have in place. And so when we're working with the CPAs and or their investment advisors or their attorneys, um, we have all, we always drop that if you've got any clients with small um, community or small family foundations. And we have converted several of those into donor advised funds. And that's an easy, I mean, that's a two and a half million dollars, just boom. It's not a lot of $50,000, you know, it's, it's more significant gifts. So you can kind of target some of that too. Um, in that, in one of our case stories, it was, it's kind of cute. Um, we had a 92 year old woman who decided that um, she wanted to set up uh, a fund through her advisor and, and bring it to us. And she sat down with Patty and me and she, and she said, um, I have given to the same 10 organizations for the last 20 years. Please help me find something different. And so Patty and I went up to her home and she had cats and Patty's really allergic, so um, that was a challenge. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so um, and she sat and we talked about all the various things that, that her, um, that she and her daughter were um, excited about. And her husband had just recently passed away at the age of like 93. And so she talked about, you know, oh gosh, George would have liked this or George would have liked that. Well, George was really involved in Kiwanis and really involved in um, a um, camp that out, out in the lake that Kiwanis helped sponsor. And so in the course, we took away a bunch of ideas and in the app we left. And so here's now Patty's job is to um, start calling these various organizations. She calls the camp and she says, so um, we've got a potential donor. What, what do you guys need? And they said, well, we've got a pontoon boat. And the pontoon boat, I mean, it's a beautiful pontoon boat, but the motor doesn't work. And so we had all these kids, and we can't take them out on the lake fishing, blah, blah, blah. And so then my colleague starts calling um, motor companies and finding out what kind of motor you put on a pontoon boat and how big the motor should be, and you know, because we're full service, right? <laughs> and uh, Did you install it, too? Just about. Almost, just almost. About. We almost swamped it, too. So, right? um, <laughs> so we wound up, we went to her with the idea of, uh, of a motor for this pontoon boat so the kids could go out and go fishing. She loved the idea, and we said, how, how can we make this really special for you? And so they named the boat the George after uh, her husband. And so um, that was just one little small cute example of what wouldn't have happened if she wouldn't have yeah. brought that fund to us. That she would have given to those same 10 people that she's been given to for 20 years and she's just so pleased. Now she comes to us and says, what are we going to do next? And she <laughs> added to the fund six months later. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was great. So, Yes, yes, please. The, each of the, the, the fund managers reports under the same format. Yeah. We, we require them to report under the same format so mm -hmm. that we're, we're trying to now, that's what I mentioned before. They all five. have a tendency to tweak the thing right. and, and yeah. we, we had some nose to nose conversations with some really long term fund managers, the banks, the trust departments who have been there for 60 years and said, get with it or we're gonna pull the money out and, and go someplace else. And they had to all comply and report to this, and I forget what the name of it is right now, but there's a scorecard, excuse me. Scorecard is the name of the organization that, that we said, here's the thing, you report according to their criteria, you send the numbers there and let them massage them and send them to us. It, it, it costs them some money, but the next step is that we wanna have it where we avoid scorecard and the information, the raw data will be sent directly to a third party who will then provide us with all of this stuff analyzed. Where it gets a little complicated, I'm just thinking back on our learning curve, was um, at the beginning we had one advisor and um, he always, you know, his investments were never quite doing quite as well as everybody else and we were, you know, like, what's the deal? He's one of the best people in the community. And, and then when we sat down with him and talked with him about it, well, each, he has very aggressive givers. He's very philanthropic himself and he identifies his clients who are very philanthropic. So he had a lot sitting in cash because he knew that they were going to be giving a lot away that year. So you have to keep the donors 
um, intent, their philanthropic intent in mind um, when they're doing this because, again, we were originally looking at this all like this is our long-term investment policy statement, but sometimes it's not long-term. Well, but, okay, I, I would jump in here and so, say you, it, it may have been all in yeah. cash when it was under the name of that particular donor. Now it's my money, and so I'm going to invest it according to our... But that's, but we, but we... Th Try to invest. We, you know, we categorize cash mid and long. -term. Yeah, yeah, we do cash midterm, long term. We make it known so. right up front this, that you follow our investment policy or you don't get the money. So well, you do it all only uh, with a long term investment policy. Strategy. Long term, if it's an endowed, if endowed dollars all go. See, these the aren't same. endowed dollars. That's the difference. Well, if they're pass throughs, that's something different. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then mm -hmm. we look for uh, uh, a mutual fund that we, we keep it liquid so we can turn it out as fast as they can. We, we talk to the donor to see what sort of plans they have and line it up, but we're not trying to invest longer than you know 15 minutes because you never know what they're going to do. Right, right. So that, yeah, that's that, something that, you have to keep in mind. Yeah. What's the, what are their goals? I have, out. for you, if you're interested, I have some of our, our pieces on Investment Partners Program up here today, our donor advised friend brochure for any of you that uh, wants them today. It's also, it's also on our website. And it's on our website. And if you're, some of your board is on worried about this opportunity contact Tim contact Nancy and I we can talk to our our investment committee chair and they'll we'll give Rapids us great is support nice in the summer right? oh. <laughs> um, we can come visit you yeah. I will share yeah. one thing yeah. Chris do you remember when I first started coming to the uh, uh, Midwest Independent mm -hmm. Community Foundations and I talked to you guys about what it is we were doing with our trust and I thought you were going to bundle me off with a jacket that wrapped in si and buckled in the back because you said what kind of crazy <laughs> stuff is this <laughs> yeah, that was seven or eight years ago and now the industry is looking at that because they recognize that people that the donors if they've got a self-directed IRA they want to have a little bit of a they, they want to have some piece of that you, you can't give them control but you got to give them some kind of a say at some point in time in terms of where those dollars are going to go. They aren't going to accept the fact that you're just going to take it and say thanks, goodbye. Other questions? Been a great audience. Please Thank put the you. dollar in the bucket on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> We're back next week, folks. Two drink minimum. Yeah. <laughs>